Hi. Um, so, as Courtney said, um, I've been leading a team looking into what would be involved in pr uh, providing a PaaS for government. And uh, when we started this project uh, a few months ago, uh, we were all saying, you know, it's a really fast-moving field, uh, there's a lot of new technologies, uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out that we'd like to use, but it's not yet 1.0. If we just sit tight for two years, we'll be able to pick the right solution off the shelf. I now no longer think that. So I'm going to tell you uh, what we did, what we've learned, and what I think now. First, um, I'll tell you who we work for. Um, I work for the Government Digital Service, which is a unit of government within the UK's Cabinet Office. The first thing we did was build the gov.uk website, which is the best place to find government services and information in the UK. But we're not just fixing websites. We also work with departments to transform digital services. So, for example, um, one example is register to vote. It used to be in the UK that um, you would get a letter to your home address and then you'd have to fill it in and post it back if you wanted to get onto the electoral register. Now you can register to vote online. Uh, another example um, of a service that we've helped transform is um, making an appointment to visit somebody in prison. Uh, again, this used to be uh, you would have to phone up the prison um, and make an appointment on the phone, and people were regularly on hold for more than an hour to make that call. Now you can book the appointment online. But there are over 800 services like this in government, so to transform them all one by one in this way would take years. So now we're looking at um, common problems, uh, platforms, components that we can use to, um, to speed that up. And the most common problem is hosting. So that's what gave us the idea of a platform as a service. So I probably don't need to explain PaaS to most of you. Many of you will have used Heroku um, and know the advantage of being able to deploy your application without worrying about the servers, where they are, how to configure them, etc. Here's how we're pitching the idea in government. So we're using the slide, we're talking about um, how each team, every team that's hosting a website, needs to build the same technical stack over and over again. So every, every team needs to build, you know, find a monitoring solution, a host, um, logging, alerting, a database, maybe not the same database, but somewhere to store their data probably. And this takes away from the time that the team can spend on their core expertise, on basically delivering value for the user, on making the service as user-friendly as possible. So this is our other slide. Um, this is what a PaaS would look like. You know, we'd provide the monitoring, we'd provide the alerting, we'd provide the logging. And the application teams just need to worry about deploying their application. They don't need to think about that. So that's pretty much the same way you'd sell it in your own organization. Um, there's an additional complication in government in that buying services is very difficult. Because we're spending taxpayers' money, we need to make sure that when we do decide what to buy, we do so in an open and fair way which is right, because it is public money, but it, you know, it can take a long time. So if you just want to like, spin up a prototype uh, to, get, you know, to test something out to see if you're even building the right thing, you might not have that lead time. So the idea would be, we do that procurement, we pr procure the infrastructure, and then you as an application team wanting to test out a service quickly, you can just get on board with us. So, um, the initial, we had some initial thoughts about what, would be, what, would, uh, what a PaaS for government would need. The first thing is, uh, it needs to be self-service. So we've learned from um, working on gov.uk that the infrastructure team can very easily become you know, an, an admin team, uh, deploying servers, um, buying SSL certificates, that kind of thing. And in order to scale it, it would be better if it was self-service and application teams could do that kind of thing themselves. The second thing we thought was important was a support model. We're very keen on GDS as a support model where application developers support their own applications out of ours. So we'd want to perpetuate that on the platform. Application teams receive alerts for their um, applications. The platform team would just be on call for the platform itself. So that would mean no runbooks. There wouldn't be a situation where an application goes down in the middle of the night and some web op is going through a runbook of an application they don't know anything about to work out how to fix it. Um, which leads to a better experience for the end user, because the, the people who actually built the application are the ones who are in the best position to work out how to fix it properly. Something else that's pretty important um, in, uh, for a path for government is multi-tenancy. So when I talk about multi-tenancy, I'm talking about three things. Uh, granularity of user permissions. So 
You want to have teams, um, different teams running different services. And a team would have uh, an administrator, a couple of administrators, and they should be able to add other team members um, who maybe don't have as many permissions. But you wouldn't expect that team administrator to be able to administer another team or even know anything about the other team. Second thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about multi-tenancy is um, handling resource contention. So as in many of your organizations, we have you know, peaks and troughs throughout the year. Um, many of these in government are statutory. And we also have um, unexpected loads uh, occasionally. So for example, a while ago, there was a piece on the BBC about um, pensions, and it pointed to a pensions calculator on gov.uk. And it's a calculator, it's a dynamic page, it's not static, so it's not cached. So lots of people went to go and calculate how much pension they were due, and we suddenly had this unexpected load. Um, and that will be the same you know, in your organizations. Um, the difference uh, is, it, for us, it might be on the BBC. Um, and we need to make sure that that kind of unexpected load doesn't impact um, the statutory deadlines other services need to stick to. And the third thing I'm talking about in multi-tenancy is isolation from other tenants. So you wouldn't expect one tenant to be able to look at the logs of another tenant or um, sniff their network traffic, that kind of thing. Uh, and the last thing we thought was important, the fourth thing we thought was important, was um, we thought it should be able to run on multiple cloud providers. So by that I mean IaaS providers, um, AWS, Azure, that kind of thing. And the reason for that is government has spent a long time being locked into uh, certain suppliers by long contracts, and we don't now want to lock ourselves in by the technology we choose. And when you build something on one IaaS provider, it's pretty difficult to move to another one. It can be very, very difficult if you don't think about it from the beginning. Um, so we wanted to build that in from the start. The details of how we were actually going to run on multiple cloud providers weren't wasn't clear to us um, at the beginning. We weren't sure whether we meant, like, would we have the exact same thing running on, say, AWS and Azure, and you know, traffic would go from one to the other, or um, would we have you know, one running on Azure and a warm backup on GCE? We'd, we didn't know. We thought we'd figure that out. So I'll tell you what we've done. Uh, the first thing we did was look into what technologies were out there, open source and commercial. and um, we split into pairs and spent a couple of days on each one, uh, testing it against our selection criteria, uh, the things I've mentioned, and some other things. This is the whiteboard that we went um, and wrote stuff up on as we, as we discovered about each thing. Um, I've written a post on the GDS technology blog that goes into this in a lot more detail, who we looked at, what we discovered about each of them. So if you're interested in that, you can go and check that out. There's a link later on. But at the end of that, there were three clear front runners, and they were Deus, Cloud Foundry, and Suru. So I'll talk a little bit about Deus first, um, because we decided not to use Deus in the prototype for two reasons. Um, it didn't have the granularity of user permissions that we, we required, and it didn't have any um, service brokers, so you couldn't use services outside the platform, like Postgres or whatever. Um, but it's a very interesting technology. Both those things are on its roadmap. Um, so that's definitely one to keep an eye on and um, check that out. Cloud Foundry you've probably heard of. Um, they're a really big player in the PaaS market, very fully featured. Uh, you might have heard of them because uh, eight, a couple of weeks ago, 18F announced their, um, their PaaS solution, which is built on Cloud Foundry. Uh, 18F work with the US Digital Service, and they are, they are addressing a lot of the similar things that we are, so we've talked to them quite a lot about that. And Suru, you probably haven't heard of, so I'll tell you a bit more about them. They are built by uh, the infrastructure team of a company called Globo, which is a huge media company in Brazil. They, I think they're the second largest media company by advertising revenue after ABC in the world. And um, Suru uh, is run by, the infrastructure team is about eight developers, ar around eight. And they both run the platform in production, uh, so they run about 400 applications in about 800 containers. Um, and they also maintain the code base, uh, make it open source. They're very responsive to pull requests. They do regular releases. And the fact that you know, this small team do both of those things speaks quite highly to how simple and straight, straightforward it is. Um, and because it is pretty straightforward um, and it would be quickly, it would be easy to get something up and running, um, we use Suru to build an initial prototype. 
And then we took the prototype out and started showing it to our potential users in government to see what they thought. Not what they thought of Suru, but what they thought of you know, what we were trying to do with a PaaS. Um, while some people in the team were doing that, others, uh, the rest of us were building out the same functionality in Cloud Foundry to compare, to see how the two compare against each other. We haven't uh, worked out yet which the most suitable technology would be, um, but when we do, we will write it up on our blog, um, so you can check that out. Um, that's not what I want, that is not what I want to talk about right now. Um, though I will say, uh, if these are problems that interest you, then um, we are hiring. <laughs> anyway, um, what I want to talk about is what we've learned from our users. So, they definitely like the idea of a PaaS. Self-service uh, is something that would be good for both sides. Not only would the, te the infrastructure team not be administrative, they would not have to wait for things, for tickets to be actioned. Uh, Multi-tenancy is something that's important. The support model we suggested uh, has buy-in across government. But the feedback on the multiple cloud providers wasn't what we expected at all. None of our users wanted it. They weren't interested at all. And it's very hard. So we knew that we'd be building something that was like the lowest common denominator across IaaS providers, but we hadn't realized the kind of things we'd be working around. So one example is um, GC don't have um, internal load balancers, internal DNS. So if your uh, application wants to touch your other internal application, you've got to go out to the internet and come back in again. And I mean, there's a lot of discussion about this on their mailing list. It doesn't look like it's something they're going to address anytime soon. So we, we hadn't realized quite what kind of things we'd be working around. And it also means you can't take advantage of the cool features of various, various providers. So when we looked back at you know, what we were trying to do, um, we realized that we were conflating resilience uh, with the commercial concerns. So um, resilience you can address with each infrastructure provider's own services, right? using regions or availability zones or whatever. Um, but we were, we were thinking about the vendor lock-in aspect. But users do still have a need for government to avoid being locked into one vendor um, to get you know, competition between vendors. Um, so basically, we're going back now to look at whether there are other, other ways to address that need rather than what we were talking about with hot, hot or whatever across, across multiple cloud providers. OK, so I've talked about what we learned from our users. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what we learned about PaaS technologies. So I said at the beginning that um, we originally thought that if we just sit tight for two years, we could just pick the right technology. And I don't think that anymore. Because I don't think there is going to be one right technology, one PaaS solution. There are a lot of differences now between PaaS technologies. And I think that that's actually going to continue to be the case. So I mean, one example is you know, some of them are designed to work in virtualized environments. Some of them are running containers directly on hardware which is probably the right way to run containers. Um, and I think that will, that will continue to be the case. That's not particularly important to our users. Something that is, um, is that some of them support multi-tenancy, and some of them don't. And I think that will also continue to be the case, because that is something that's important to some organizations, and it's not important to others. We now know that it's important to our users. So, now that we've done this user research, we're in a position to choose the technology that would actually address their problems. This ties back to um, GDS's service design principles. These are 10 principles for designing a digital service. And the first one is start with needs, start with user needs. If you don't know what your users want, you won't build the right thing. And we've discovered that again on this project, right? They need multi-tenancy. <clears throat> they, don't, they don't need resilience across multiple public clouds. So now we've done this research, we're in a position to choose a technology that will address the problems that they are actually trying to solve, which is the most important thing. So if you only take one thing away from this talk, then please could it be make sure you understand what your users need. Thank you. Thank you.